This is The Causes of Things, and I'm your host, Michael O'Fallon. Men and women throughout the United States are being put into an unconstitutional decision box. In light of current information that is coming in from the vaccine and its effectiveness, or lack thereof, do they take what should still be considered an experimental vaccine with a short effectiveness, a short lifespan, which of course would lead to another vaccine booster four months from now, and then another, and then another, in perpetuity? Vaccines that have emergency use, but the overall concern is whether or not there is really an emergency. Vaccines where long-term effects aren't known because, well, because they haven't been out for even a full year yet. And they are told that they will lose their jobs if they don't submit. If they don't obey and take the vaccine against their will and against their better judgment. And despite what is becoming the volumes of information available about the dangers of the vaccines, such information is avoided or suppressed by the mainstream media. If you talk about the safety and effectiveness of the vaccines on social media, it is likely that you'll be removed from many platforms. You have to go searching for information, usually in dry and less than accessible areas. All of the media, the commercials, and politicians from both sides are saying, get vaccinated. And yet there are no warnings at all. You don't have the fast-talking background information on the commercials that are telling you to get vaccinated like you do for psoriasis, erectile dysfunction, or other maladies where the commercials tell you that you may go blind. You might develop an irregular heartbeat or, in some rare cases, die from taking the latest medication that will stop your toenail fungus. Think about it. You don't have any of these kinds of long-winded explanations and warnings on anything to do with the vaccines. So with all of the information that is coming out about Moderna, let's say, possibly harming teens because of myocarditis, or that the entire population of vaccinated people is vulnerable to blood clotting. You will hear nothing. So as the vaccinations keep possibly injuring people, we don't know, of course, in full, because we just don't have that information, it's not provided to us. Those vaccines have proven to not protect us from COVID, as originally promised by Joe Biden and the CDC. And yet the administration and its handmaidens in the media pretend that this isn't so and keep demanding that every single person be vaxxed. And yet if you don't get vaccinated, you are out. Out of your federal job. Out of the military. Out of your job with the police. Out of your job at the school. Out of your job as a nurse or a doctor where you risk your own health to help those with COVID. And then, out of your job in the private sector, out of your job at the airlines, out of your job as a trucker, out of your job at your radio station or TV station, out of your job possibly at the ministry, if you work for Creation Ministries International. Maybe it isn't affecting your job yet, but maybe, maybe you have had COVID and have strong, robust antibodies, which the antibodies are 10 times stronger in resistance to COVID than the vaccines. But yet, in many cities and in many states across our nation, and possibly in other countries like Australia and New Zealand, you can't eat at the restaurant you want to unless you are vaccinated. There are no exceptions. You can't go on a cruise on Carnival or Royal Caribbean without a vaccination. No exceptions. You can't go to a concert or a ball game. No exceptions, unless you are vaccinated. And so many have asked, what is really going on here? Because the vaccine has been proven to not really help in preventing the spread of COVID-19. Nor has it been showing, actually, to help reduce the time of hospitalization. That's what we're beginning to see right now. So yes, what is going on here? What is really happening? What's behind all of this? Well, First, if you take a look on the show notes for today or on the article that accompanies this particular podcast, I have provided a 2018 article from three years ago, and this is in the show notes, that should begin to bring some clarity from the very words of those associated with the World Economic Forum and Gavi. 
In the article, you will see that what is articulated is that, quote, immunization is an entry point for digital identity, end quote. So as we, as I have been warning about for years on my podcast and in my speeches, as we transition from an analog, real, objective, modern world and into a digital, fake, subjective, postmodern world, it is important for those that seek to be our overlords that as we transition into that digital world is that we all have one standard digital identity, a digital, trackable, traceable identity for every human being on Earth. And from the article on our show notes, the author states this, quote, The message was reinforced at this year's World Economic Forum meeting in Davos, Switzerland, where Gavi announced digital identity as the focus for its 2018 Infuse program. Infuse innovation for uptake, scale, and equity in immunization aims to identify and support innovative solutions that have the potential to modernize global health and immunization delivery. This year, Gavi is focusing its efforts on identifying opportunities for digital identity technologies to help facilitate better targeting, follow-up, and immunization service delivery for the world's most vulnerable children. Immunization poses a huge opportunity to scale digital identity. In many developing countries, immunization coverage greatly exceeds birth registration rates. End quote. The article goes on to make it very clear what they are proposing, more or less a sacramentalization of the digital ID assignment. Quote, when a child receives her first vaccine, she receives a paper child health card. In many developing countries, the most common form of identification is not a birth certificate anymore, but this card. The near ubiquity of these documents presents an enormous opportunity. End quote. Now, I need you to stop for a moment and understand what they are proposing. And this was back in 2018. They are proposing that a vaccination card can be made mandatory for digital identification, as opposed to a birth certificate. I continue. Quote, Moving from easily lost or damaged paper health cards to an accessible digital form would reduce the burden associated with trafficking a child's vaccines and eliminate redundant or unnecessary paperwork. End quote. So you move from that old analog form of proof of identification, you know, eliminate all of that unnecessary paperwork, and go to a fully digital, which will stay with the child or person for the rest of their lives. Well, let's get back to this article. Quote, digital child health cards can improve coverage rates and vaccine compliance by prompting parents to bring their children in for necessary subsequent doses. For health workers, digital identity technology validates a child's past vaccines and may streamline analytics and outreach without adding significant complexity to a health worker's workflow. And for Gavi and its international partners, Digital ID technology provides a basis for a system of verifiable proofs and accurate aggregate data that interpolates with other identity management systems, negating the need for each organization to independently identify beneficiaries. End quote. Again, they are stating clearly that the vaccine ID provides a basis for other systems of verifiable truths with aggregated information that will be combined with other identity management systems. In other words, combinable with other systems that could be like maybe your credit score, maybe your ESG score. Let's go back to the article. It continues, quote, And because immunization is conducted in infancy, providing children with a digital child health card that would give them a unique portable digital identity early in life. And as children grow, their digital child health card can be used to access secondary services, such as primary school, or ease the process of obtaining alternative credentials. Effectively, the child health card becomes the first step in establishing a legal, broadly recognized identity. End quote. So what Gavi which was birthed from the World Economic Forum, is stating back in 2018 
that a digital vaccination card will be used throughout the life of each individual to validate their existence, obtain services, combine with other identification credentials. And this is universal. It is their entry into the new world, into the new system, into the new society. For everyone, a new privileged class that you must join. Everyone, every man, woman, and child, must be on board. You have no choice. If you don't join in, you are out. You will not be able to participate in society. And what this is called, this is called a form of entryism. It is creating two classes of people, those who obey and are part of the order of the new world system that will receive privileges, and those who are disobedient who are not part of the new dystopia that need to be oppressed, shunned, and discriminated against. That is what is happening. They are creating an entryway into a new supranation, a new system, a new world. You are being reset, and they are resetting the requirements for citizenship and belonging in the new world. It is worldwide entryism. And if you haven't had the chance to hear what the New Zealand Prime Minister, you know, a woman who was part of the World Economic Forum's Young Leaders Group, and I mean this was just two days ago, the New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern just said the frightening and normally quiet part out loud. And what she said and admitted to is that they are creating two classes of people, the unvaxxed being the oppressed and the vaxxed with privileges. So when asked by a reporter if she was creating two classes of people with the vaccinated receiving special privileges, the prime minister confirmed saying, quote, that is what it is. Yep. End quote very casually and with a smile on her face. The face of totalitarian evil. And so the answer to what is going on here is quite simple, if you haven't figured it out yet. And it isn't just in what's happening medically. It's in everything. It is all a form of entryism. And there are many different forms that entryism can take. So Dr. James Lindsay and I spoke about this a bit in two of our conversations that you've probably seen on our YouTube or Rumble channels, where we talk through how businesses and government institutions say that, quote, we're only hiring people of a certain kind, end quote. And that means not just a question of vaccinated, but also those that will comply with their theological and ideological frameworks that are interlaced with critical race theory and intersectionality. And that practiced in the communist literature from years ago, especially practiced through Trotsky, is called entryism. It's about getting inside of an organization and infiltrating the organization, then removing good people first by one means or another, but it's getting inside of an organization and bringing in ideologically conformist views that are going to allow those in charge to start changing the culture and ideas from within the organization. So if you're about to change the entire culture, an entire way of doing things in a business or even in a nation, you want those to be obedient to you and that they will do all the crazy things that you will ask them to do in the future, that they won't question it. They will comply. You don't want employees that will start demanding their rights or that will call their attorneys as you start to roll in crazy ideologies or insane new requirements that will change every four to six months. See, you are resetting the requirements for employment at businesses, corporations, ministries, etc. And also for the ability to actually exist within the new system that you're putting in the world. And I need you to think about this for just a second. The idea of vaccine mandates only started to be discussed seriously back in June. Last June. 
If you remember, Biden denied before the election that he would ever impose vaccine mandates. But here they are, and they are everywhere. And all of these are in forms of entryism. And strictly defined entryism can be understood as basically a tactic in which the members of an organized group conspire to secretly join a larger organization en masse with the intention of changing the targeted organization's policies or actions. And so entryism provides a means for a small but determined group to leverage their influence onto a larger sphere by using the entered organization's resources, such as state funding, existing networks of activists, or voter goodwill, let's say. So entryism is particularly effective where there is a large but inactive party with many inactive members who might pay their fees but not really do anything else. It is most commonly associated with attempts to move an organization further leftward or more progressive in a way that is gradualistic, bit by bit, drip by drip. But it is not exclusive to political parties. Entryists could target a campaigning organization, a charity, a club, a society or faith-based religious group, like the Roman Catholic Church or the Southern Baptist Convention. In particular, in organizations or, let's say, denominations or religious organizations where no larger hierarchy exists, those practicing a form of entryism many times will create a larger coalition of normally separated groups or denominations to create a previously non-existing but new authoritative hierarchy within their new coalition. And then that new hierarchy or coalition will now have sway over those previously disconnected organizations or, let's say, denominations. And anyone who is inside the coalition will be protected and in the club, while everyone else is out, dangerously out. This can also happen within a nation where a shadow government is created, where different leadership is pulled into a secretive or not-so-secretive group that attempts to pull authority away from the legitimate leader or government. This can happen within, let's say, as I said before, the Republican Party, which I watched personally from 2008 to 2015 and saw that the Republican Party was simply becoming the more acceptable version of the liberal progressive Democrat Party, with globalism and the end of the United States as their aim. That is what started with George Bush Sr., or even further back if we go to the Rockefeller Republicans of the 60s and 70s. And you can also see this happening within the intelligence agencies, like the FBI, the NSA, the CIA, and then with the military-industrial complex, gaining control, refusing orders, sticking with the strategic mission that so many Americans, and even those in government, over them, are not even aware of. You can see this over the past 70 to 80 years covertly within the Council on Foreign Relations, and I know many men and women who are members of the Council on Foreign Relations and publicly within the United Nations, the public-private partner of the World Economic Forum. And so you can see what happened over the past four years in the Trump administration and with the Republicans, where even cabinet members under Trump that were hired by the Trump administration started doing the opposite of what he had ordered, eventually culminating with the Republican cabinet members turning their back on the president after the election. And with Nancy Pelosi the woke military and big tech corporations basically neutering the president of the United States. Just think about it, over a hyperbolic setup that is becoming so much clearer for everyone to see now. And all of this was done to ensure that there would be a great reset of America. And at the same time, take the power of the elections away from the people. And once you've done that, take the constitutional rights away from American citizens. And the next step, of course, is to turn over all of our sovereignty to the technocrats, to the elites, to those that will make our decisions for us. But they will make the decisions that will benefit them, and not you. And the exact same thing is happening everywhere, at the same time, all over the world. And it is all a form of entryism. 
And you can see this very clearly in the corporate world under the 50-year influence of the World Economic Forum, most notably, of course, in the private sector, where most corporations and businesses that have a significant amount of either BlackRock or of Vanguard controlling their boards. Well, this is what they're doing. And forms of entryism go back, far back. Most folks want to begin the discussion with Trotsky. But you need to understand that in many ways, this is how most religions work. With religions, in the beginning phases, a proselyte that enters into the new religion goes through the rituals and catechesis necessary to become a catechumenate. This, of course, takes a different form with different religions and denominations. There is then a period of time where the person seeking entrance into the new faith or tribe, where they must isolate memorize, and then commit to the sign of the covenant or the ritual that will be the physical sign that they are part of the new religious body of obedient believers. Maybe that ritual is baptism. Maybe the ritual has other dead to the old self and then alive to the new self built in. And then following that, there must be a strict obedience to whomever the religious leader in the newly joined religion is. And in many ways... That is what is happening here. And I will go into the religious nature of what is happening around more in a future, the causes of things, where I can go on in length to describe what you have been seeing since 2019. And the new religious dogmas that you must believe. The primary belief system that you must be obedient to. Well, the new system that you must be obedient to, regardless if you are in a faith-based religion or not, The new primary belief system for everyone across the world. You can see the signs in Afghanistan. You can see them in Mexico. You can see them across the United States. You can see all the world leaders wearing the circle that describes the 17 SDGs. The new belief system that you must support, the doctrines that you must hold on to, are the United Nations 2030 Agenda Sustainability Goals. These 17 sustainable goals are also the primary doctrines that you must support and believe to be a part of the new economy, with the fascist church father, if you will, being Klaus Schwab, with his ever-dutiful servants like Larry Fink, CEO of BlackRock, Mark Benioff, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Salesforce, or Al Gore, as the primary cardinals or grand muftis of these entryism schemes. And so certain ways of doing things and doing business is about to change. Kind of a great reset. And those that are following the exact and precise direction of those that are associated with the World Economic Forum must be in lockstep with them. You can't afford to have anyone disobey your new doctrinal codes. You need submission from those in your workforce as you bring in ideas like anti-racism. And anti-racism is the idea that the only way to eliminate past discrimination is to institute present discrimination in what would be considered the dominant hegemonic groups, which in the U.S. is considered those that are white. And of course, this means that you will need to employ intersectional methodologies to achieve this goal. And many people now who are conservative understand what intersectionality is. Intersectionality is the new systematic semi-religious systems for everything in the new neo-Marxist autocratic technocratic world. And to build back better, everything must be burnt to the ground first before you can build back. And that is what critical race theory critical pedagogy, critical gender studies, hyperreality, and all of the other radically subjective concepts are here to do. To destroy our epistemology. Destroy our ways of knowing. Destroy our paths of falsification. And lead us to a subjective, fallacious, digital world run by those that are trying to create something that looks like the nightmarish dreams of Rousseau, Hegel, Marx, H.G. Wells, George Bernard Shaw, Gramsci, Mao, Herbert Marcuse, Jacques Derrida, Julian Huxley, and Brzezinski. It is the most toxic stew of horrible ideas that has ever been formulated by man. It will destroy mankind. And that is exactly 
what the primary goals of this entire movement is. To change mankind. But I digress. Well, as I was stating before, the World Economic Forum, BlackRock, and the new United States-styled economic entryism is a way to separate those that will be obedient from those that will be disobedient. And privileges in the perfected state will be given to those that are obedient. This would be the G in the World Economic Forum's new ESG principles that will be shoved down everyone's throat in the coming year. Once again, in ESG, remember that the E in ESG represents the environmental dedication that either a company or you, an individual, is dedicated towards, eliminating your carbon footprint, trying to achieve net zero emissions, eliminating fossil fuels, going fully solar, or water conservation, etc. Now, the S in ESG is primarily centered around diversity, equity, and inclusion, ensuring that your workplace has diverse standpoints, diverse epistemic standpoints, that you are practicing equity, which is not equality, and basically ensures that we have equal outcomes regardless of the merits of individuals. Inclusion, inclusiveness, excluding, though, whiteness. The G in ESG, well, the G, they would like to tell you is mainly about onboarding executives, following a diversity, equity, inclusion framework for your board. But it is also about following governance and supporting governance that supports the ESG and DEI principles, which would mean that you would want to make sure that you're supporting candidates in political action that will support your new religion, which would mean supporting the 17 Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations. That is the intent. So in this circular reasoning, in the midst of circular reasoning, only those supporting the concepts that are being generated by the new worldwide cult will be allowed to do business in the new economy. And this will extend to individuals as well, not just corporate. Do you need a mortgage refinance? Well, how is your personal ESG score? How have you been doing with your social justice and anti-racism work? Is your family diverse or are you an ally against systemic oppression? Well, not good enough. Sorry. No mortgage refinance for you. Well, how about do you work at a company that is non-compliant with ESG standards? You know, have they been jumping through all of the literally insane new climate mandates for use of electricity and conservation of water? Oh, they haven't? Oh, the company you work for has not done everything that they can do. Well, that's going to hurt your personal credit because of who you work for. Well, how about that church you attend? You know, do they have too many straight white males and not enough African-American lesbians and Asian transsexuals? Has that church been active in its attempt to erase systemic oppression and bring women in for leadership roles in your church? Is it a diverse church, or are the majority of people that attend the church white? Oh, your your church hasn't done that? Well, that's really going to hurt your credit score, you know. But that church might not be around much longer anyway, as the banks are going to refuse to do business with that old white epistemology that that church represents with that old, systemically oppressive hermeneutic that that church uses in their interpretation of the Bible. You'd better leave that church if you know what's good for you. So, they will make it painful for businesses, painful for churches, and painful especially for individuals to be guided rightly by their own conscience. They will demand that you accept their new world of radical subjectivity where everything in the new world is fake. Their world, where they will insist that you believe and at least obediently say that 2 plus 2 equals 5. That is entryism. And you will be squeezed. And entryism is being applied to completely change affinity groups. 
You know, James Lindsay and I spent some time with Catherine Jepson Moore in London just a couple of years ago. And Mrs. Moore had been ostracized and pushed out of her knitting groups because she refused to participate in the nonsensical CRT-inspired entryism at the international knitting group named Ravelry. And where Ravelry banned any expression of support for Donald Trump, arguing that, quote, We cannot provide a space that is inclusive of all and also allow support for open white supremacy. Support of the Trump administration is unambiguously support for white supremacy. End quote. And anyone that disagreed with Ravelry's statement was shut out, was silenced was outcast, and only those that would either agree to stay silent about any support for Donald Trump or those that were violently against Donald Trump were allowed to stay in Ravelry's international knitting group. That, ladies and gentlemen, is entryism. And all of a sudden, you are out of a group that maybe you've given years to and your dues to and spent your time supporting. If you don't accept the new direction that the new group is taking that organization, you're out. And there is no coming back in without repentance and humiliation because this is a cult. The same has happened over the past several years now in the travel industry, which I will go into more in detail in the coming weeks. But once again, using entryism, Those that are at the forefront of groups like IMEX, MPI, and other international travel organizations that influence policy worldwide, they are practicing entryism in a very Trotskyite sense. This past month, IMEX, the world's largest convention of those in the hotel, cruise, and travel industry, announced that you cannot attend IMEX Las Vegas this year unless you are fully vaccinated even if you recently had the virus and recovered and have antibodies. And of course, what goes along with this vaccination is that IMEX this year, as it was the last two years that I was invited, will be focusing in on the United Nations 2030 Agenda Goals, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Yes, you must support the precepts of critical race theory in the travel industry. As the travel industry continues to disrupt and dismantle their own travel industry. The world's largest travel exhibition and conference will be telling everyone to start thinking about not traveling as much. They said as much in 2019 at their UN Agenda 2030 Sustainability Workshop that I attended. For that matter, they've been pumping in this CRT-derived Marcusian nonsense since 2015 in both their IMEX conference in America and the one in Frankfurt. And like I said, I've been hearing this really for about 10 years in the travel industry. And in many cases, I've been the lone voice against this as a board seat holding executive in the travel industry over the past 12 years. Now, many of you don't realize this. Many of you just think of me as someone who's involved in this in church settings. That's where you know me. But I have been just as active in what's happening within the travel industry and within corporate America and within politics and even, as I will go into later, in the military. But in the travel industry, every major cruise line has adopted the United Nations 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. And what is coming is that those that are doing business with the cruise lines must have excellent ESG scores as well. You see, because this is a cult. The same will be with all the major hotels with all the major airlines, because this is entryism. And if you're not doing your part to uphold and support the concepts of intersectionality, critical social justice, and other such conspiracy theories, well, then you should be shunned from the community. This is an ideological form of entryism that will as well affect your bottom line, your ability to do business. This is combined with the, quote, if they are not going to take the vaccine, they will most likely cause us problems with our bold neo-Marxist move for the future of disrupting and dismantling the travel industry, end quote. So, a combination of medical entryism with ideological and political entryism. And then there is theological, ideological, and political entryism. And so now I want to specifically address those of you that are Christians in our listening audience, 
I want to ask you this question first. Why do you think the Gospel Coalition exists? The Gospel Coalition, the ERLC, and others have been supplying the operational preparation of the environment for years to create a coalition that is all in on critical social justice, that is all in on anti-nationalism and the deconstruction of the United States, that supports unconstitutional supranationalism, that supports the ideas of diversity, equity, and inclusion, the handmaidens of critical race theory. That is softening the faithful during the great and painful transition into the Fourth Industrial Revolution. That is their role. Because this is, now come on, you folks in the Gospel Coalition, the Roman Catholic Church, and in moderate Islam, might as well start saying the quiet part out loud. This is the role of religion in the Great Reset as we are transitioning to the Fourth Industrial Revolution. And if you don't bow down at the altar of Herbert Marcuse, Michel Foucault, Ibram X. Kendi, and Jacques Derrida, well, you're out. It is, once again, entryism. Just like everywhere else, it is entryism. It is the dark reformation. Let me see if I can explain that. 504 years ago, we had the Reformation whose motto was Post Tenebras Lux. After darkness, light. It was the Reformation that brought light into darkness. But the Reformation of 2008 to 2021, it is after light, darkness. It is the Dark Reformation. That is what has been brought forth in this new ecumenism that will allow you to hold your doctrinal distinctives, well, at least for a while. You know, that's going to change as well. Maybe some of the leadership hasn't received that memo yet. But yes, the ecumenism that will join all major faiths. Once everything on the other side of the big sort and the Fourth Industrial Revolution is solidly in place then another entryism will take place. And you'll have to give up all of your doctrinal distinctives. And of course, all of these supposedly reformed, supposedly evangelical, supposedly Christian leaders took the church down this road at the same time that the corporations were going woke, politicians were going woke, education was going woke, Roman Catholicism was going woke, Islam was going woke, all at the same time time. And the Dunning-Kruger infected leaders of these woke religious organizations will have to make the next big decision. Do they forsake everything that they said that they believe in? Many woke religious leaders don't know it yet, but that is just a few years away. They will have to forsake everything that they say they believe in. That is coming. Because entryism always continues. It never stops in its leftward evolution to immunitize the eschaton and to perfect the state. And the church, the perfected state, is about to merge. And in many ways, thanks to these Judas leaders, it has already been the ideological and theological lapdogs of this entire reset of the Fourth Industrial Revolution. They willingly did this. And they never told you why they were doing it. They never warned you, the flock that they are leading like lambs to the slaughter, that this was coming. They knew what was coming. That is why they did this. They had said yes to the proposition that many were given years ago when it was said to them, quote, there is a change coming that there is nothing or anyone else can do to stop. So either you can jump on board and try to help transition everyone to a new form of Christianity, or you will get the stick you will be in big trouble, end quote. And they agreed to do this. And many of them, who were already secretive progressives and postmodernists, would have willingly done so without the threat. They couldn't wait to go to the next meeting at Davos or the next secret meeting at Southern Seminary. Now, many are just company men. They'll just go along with whatever the company the SBC says they're going to do. But many are just cowards. They didn't say a word to warn you. 
They knew what 2020 and 2021 would bring. And these cowards stayed silent, hoping to survive. And they said nothing. They were personally content to watch the world, the church, and you personally burn. And that is why I decided to speak up privately starting 10 years ago, and then publicly with Sovereign Nations in 2017. So all of you religious leaders that are frustrated about the resistance against critical race theory and intersectionality, well, guess where the big movement began? Well, there were some discernment ministries that did signal that Marxism was starting to creep up into the church through political operatives like Russell Moore. And they were correct. But I needed to make sure that I expanded and helped everybody to understand the larger scope of what was really going on. This wasn't just within the evangelical church. This was everywhere at the same time. So, What has now in 2020 and 2021 become a tsunami against critical race theory and radical subjectivism, well, that movement began with sovereign nations, with a then relatively unknown Dr. Jordan Peterson, with Alan Keyes, with yours truly, Michael O'Fallon in the Lincoln Library at the Trump Hotel in Washington, D.C. And I invited many evangelicals to come and participate. A couple of them did. Many didn't understand the historic nature of what was going on. The beginning of that movement that has caused so many of the unrepentant woke organizations and ministries to spin their Mott and Bailey and backpedal on their previously woke direction, well, that movement started four years ago. And I started it purposely on October 31st, 2017, with Sovereign Nations in Washington, D.C. And the crowning message was from Dr. Jordan Peterson, which that message now has over 2 million downloads in all media. And that message was the Marxist lie of white privilege. And yes... I do know their playbook because I was in their meetings 12 to 10 years ago. And I know what everyone, corporations, education, affinity groups, ministries, politicians have planned. And so we started that movement on October 31st, 2017 on the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. Yes, I did that on purpose. And our numbers were few back in 2017, because no one had any idea what we were talking about. Heck, some of the folks that spoke had no idea what we were talking about at the time. Well, they do now. And so what we are going to do is to do our anti-entryism training. Anti-entryism to empower those in workforces to push back against the public-private move of the World Economic Forum, the Democrats, and the Progressive Republicans against BlackRock. Anti-entryism training to ensure that we end ethnic and racial discrimination, that we end the attack on our constitutional values, that we end the fascistic moves of the corporate state, that we forward the constitutional rights of individuals who are endowed by their creator with inalienable rights, that we demand the freedom and rights of sovereign nations and sovereign citizens against this globalist fascist takeover. We are the sovereign revolutionaries. That is what we started on October 31st, 2017. We are coming up on four years. It is time now, ladies and gentlemen. If you can't see it now, I don't know how more I can help you. It is time to make the big push to end this Marxist form of entryism, to ensure liberty and freedom for every man, woman, and child in the United States and beyond, and end the tyrannical grip of the Biden regime and the World Economic Forum. We must come together, and we must stand together, because for the sake of Western civilization and humanity itself, we must win. I'm Michael O'Fallon, and this has been The Causes of Things. (laughs) 